Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Great to be with you. It's great to have you. And thanks for hosting us. Thank you, Dave Pagenpah, for hosting us. Yeah, yeah. Really we have two hosts, that. effectively. So um, this is uh, our fireside chat with Penny. And I think it's a really inspirational story for any young girl. And frankly, for any young boy, that what you've done in your career has led you to this very important role you have today. But I'd love to start at the beginning, if it's OK with you. Where were you born? And a little bit, what was it like to grow up in your family? Yeah. Um, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I grew up in Nashville before Nashville was cool. It was a hick town. Everybody wanted out of Nashville. Um, so I grew up there with uh, an incredible family, just a little bit uh, about my parents. Um, because from them extends a lot of who I am, as for so many of us. Um, my, my parents were both executives. My father um, started on the factory floor at a company called Genesco. It was a footwear company, Johnson & Murphy Shoes, um, Lids, uh, J, um, uh, Journeys. It's a retailer, um, retailer and, and was a manufacturer when shoes were actually manufactured in the United States. Um, Daddy started on the factory floor there, and he became CEO chairman and president of that company. It was a publicly traded company. So the daddy-daughter CEO thing is, um, be became a reality. It was not something that either of us anticipated, but became a reality and an interesting part of the story. But watching my father's leadership journey and his values was an extraordinary influence on me. My mother was an executive with Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a giant utility, um, federally, uh, um, a federally created facility that essentially electrified the South. And my mother um, was part of conservation programs in the 70s. She created and distributed con electricity conservation programs uh, and then became um, the first woman leader of a consumer power district um, in a small area in Tennessee. Um, so just watching them in their lives being part of that, and it was very much a part of their lives, was, uh, was very much a part of my upbringing. So your mom, that must have been a really unique role at the time. Yeah. And I'd love to hear, what's the most important value you feel you learned from your mom? Yeah. And then the same question about your dad. Yeah. Um, from my mom, just, just resolve and grit. Um, she didn't love uh, some of the things that she had to go through as, as a woman in, in the power industry. She didn't, really, she didn't even really love what she did. Um, she did a lot of what she did for her family. Um, so that we had the, the opportunities that we did. But she also got up every morning, got dressed, and left the house. And I was like, why are you leaving me? Where are you going that's so good that you're leaving me? <laughs> and so, I, you know, that, that, the, the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree on that one. I had the same conversation with my two daughters, who are now you know, 29 and 31, about this is why I'm leaving. It's important enough to me and to what I'm trying to do in the world, um, and it will become important to you. Uh, my father was just the legacy of leadership. His learning journey, um, he went from manufacturing to marketing to retail to, uh, he, he went all over that company. And so just his curiosity, his learning journey, um, really inspired me to know that that's what leadership is really all about. Move into a different area, do something different get to know a different group of people, um, make some hard decisions, and he told me about some of those really hard decisions. Some of those, the hardest decisions had to do with integrity, mm -hmm. where a line had been crossed about integrity, um, about telling the truth, and about people and how they treat each other. And so those were some of the lessons that, that I learned from that. Thank you for sharing. So how'd you make your first buck? <laughs> um, I wanted to work, I, so many of you were entrepreneurs like Mac and I were talking about the, the radio flyer wagon at three years old, right, forming your first company. I am not an entrepreneur. It's really not part of my DNA. I just, you know, trace this, this history of my parents, loyal executives in larger, in very large firms. Um, I wasn't an entrepreneur, but I wanted to work. Uh, so I, my first real job was working at Lynn Rossi's health food store, slinging health food sandwiches and smoothies and stuff like that when I was 14, as soon as I could get somebody to drive me from school. 14 to sounds job. pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> so how about, how about high school? What kind of kid were you? Were you an academic? Were you an athlete? Were you a theater major? What, what, was kind, of, what kind of student, kind of, how did you enjoy your extracurricular? Class A nerd, 
Okay, um, great. Yeah, nerds oh. rule, class <laughs> Satan. Um, I, 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 theater and music and those kinds of things, which frankly I think ser has served me well over the years. I mean, I'm nervous, but I can, I can get on a stage and communicate um, a really important message. And I think that the, the passion behind that um, is, is something that I, that I learned when I was young. So theater, music, school. Um, extracurricular with church and you know stuff like that. Um, I'm also a class A introvert, and I, I would imagine that if we raised our hands about that, a number of us would be, might be. Um, I'm an introvert that live that that has um, learned how to live in an extroverted world, and what that means though for many of us is that we have to find ways to restore. Mm. And I learned that you know, pretty early in my life how to do that. So that was me in, yeah. in high school. And I couldn't wait to get out of high school to go to college, and I couldn't wait to get out of college to go to work. Um, so that's... Where'd you, go, where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to school at University of Virginia, graduated there with an undergraduate business degree in 85. And then I went back and got my EMBA, one of the oldest students in my EMBA class at Kellogg at Northwestern uh, 2010 to 2012. And what was that uh, career path uh, that kind of led you eventually to Edward Jones? Yeah, um, I came out of college at a time when they stopped banks, commercial banks, with management training programs. Mm. And so there were 45 of us hired into a credit training program. I became a corporate banker, which, it, which fired my curiosity because I got to spend time learning about all kinds of different companies. It was fascinating. Like I said, I'm not an entrepreneur, but I love digging in to companies and figuring out what they're all about, figuring out the strategy, what makes them enduring. Um, so I was an analyst and then a corporate banker and then on the sort of on the edges of investment banking, um, did that for about 14 years before finding Edward Jones. Yeah, and that's interesting because you like all good future managing partners, you found Edward Jones on an internet search, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, monster.com. And uh, you said something interesting to me the other day, and I, I want to share this. Um, I asked kind of what brought you to Edward Jones in 1999, this fall of 1999. You said the investment philosophy and the business model are what brought me to Edward Jones. I stayed due to the culture, people development, and texture of the organization. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Okay. Um, so I, I was in banking for 14 years, a uh, very successful career. My parents were really proud of my career. And, ma and making my parents proud is still important to me at 58 years old and always will be. Um, but there was something missing. I didn't know what it was. I could not articulate it. There was just something missing. So I did find Edward Jones on monster.com late one night. Um, I am a first, as a, as a managing partner at Edward Jones, I am the first managing partner who didn't start my career at Edward Jones. So I was from the outside, quote unquote. Um, but I, I found Edward Jones and the business model of becoming a financial advisor at Edward Jones on monster.com. What, what brought me here was the investment philosophy and the business model. Um, I, I am steeped in finance. I'm a chartered financial analyst. I know securities analysis. I know finance. I know how to analyze companies. Um, I also know what builds wealth for individuals, enduring wealth for individuals over time, is the investment philosophy espoused by Edward Jones. It's steeped in quality, in a quality orientation, in a long-term time horizon. Saving for important goals takes a long time, uh, and diversification. Um, I knew that. When I saw that investment philosophy, I said, that's the right one. Now I'm going to be really provocative and say what I sometimes say internally. Edward Jones has an investment philosophy. Other wealth management firms have investment strategies. Those are two different things. So the investment philosophy drew me. I knew it was right. I, I knew I could have confidence in that coming into a, a new career, really. And the business model, um, the, our business model is hyper-local. We have branches in two-thirds of the counties in the United States and all 10 provinces in Canada. We are hyper-local. We are rooted in relationship. And so what I knew was that it was going to be it was going to matter if I showed up there every day. I really didn't think it mattered if I showed up at the bank every day, if it was me. Somebody had to do that deal, mm -hmm. but it didn't really matter if it was me. I wanted it to matter that it was me. So when I saw that business model and that trust building re relationship rooted business model, that drew me. 
Um, many of us say, and, and when we, we regularly introduce ourselves at Edward Jones saying how long we've been here, um, many of us say we stay because of the culture. You're gonna hear about our culture a little later uh, in, a present, in a presentation. Um, I stay because of the culture, because of the people, because of the people development, the focus, and you're gonna hear this from Jim Weddle in just a few minutes. The focus on people development, unleashing the power, the, the ingenuity, the, the individuality and creativity of people is what our firm is all about. Um, Dave, you said you, know, you, you underestimated us. Um, we talk about ourselves in a really humble kind of way. We are real, actually really humble kind of people. We're, yeah. we're kind of average people, but we come together in a way that, that <clears throat> makes for extraordinary outcomes and results. So that idea, that essence of our company is, is what's kept me here. And then, so you joined, you had your own office, which feels entrepreneurial to me. I yeah. think you underestimate yeah. yourself too. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what was your career path, you know, just briefly, leading up to kind of the conversations about managing partner? Yeah. Um, I started the way all of our managing partners have, and that is as a financial advisor. So I was a financial advisor in Livonia, Michigan. I had a branch there. I built that practice. It's the thing really that I am most proud of in my career, in my career at Edward Jones, in my entire career, because it was built on building trust with families in Livonia, Michigan. Um, I was a financial advisor for six years. I was part of our regional leadership structure. We today have 314 regions that are self-managed. They are self-led by financial advisors and be what we call BOAs, our client service professionals in that marketplace. And I was part of that leadership team. Um, I was invited into home office by Jim Weddle, who you'll meet in just a little while, uh, the beginning of 2006 and started a career trajectory that really was all about a learning journey. I changed roles every three years. I went into different parts of our company, not like my dad, I didn't go to, into all parts of our company, but went into different parts of our company and had very different experiences. Some I was more qualified for than others, and that taught me a lot about leadership development. 50% um, qualified is qualified enough. Um, and sometimes women in particular diminish our mm -hmm. qualifications based on not ticking all the boxes. I learned a lot about that during that time. Um, but I, I, I was on the business development side, I was on the product side, um, and, and just had a number of different experiences through, through that period of time um, before 2019 when I became managing partner. Terrific. Well, if it's okay, I'd like to switch gears. I'm gonna come back to your career as a managing partner in a few minutes, but as we talked about the uh, really interesting history of Edward Jones, it seemed like as we talked, uh, kind of an appropriate lens would be the errors of the different managing partners. And so if we could take a few minutes on each of those, that would be great, starting, I guess, with our founder, Edward Jones. Right. So I think tracing this, Dave, um, one thing, I wanna say two things as, as we start talking about Edward Jones. Um, this is an unabashed love letter to Edward Jones. I am unapologetic about being in love with this place, our history, and what we have the opportunity to do. That's thing one. Thing two is that, that the success of this organization has not been accidental, but it has also not been inevitable. It is inevitable only in hindsight. While these managing partners, and we're gonna trace the history of the company vis-a-vis -vis the leadership, while these managing partners have been making decisions, there was nothing inevitable about the decisions that they were making. But they were, it, each of them was rooted in the moment in time that called on them to be audacious leaders, to really take risk, and we'll talk about the P's later, but in a pragmatic kind of way that was inextricably connected to a very unique vision they had about strategy and about what their company should be. So Mr. Jones Sr. founded our company in 1922. Our charter date is January 28, 1922, so we are about to ring that bell the beginning of next year, and it's gonna be very exciting. Mr. Jones Sr. founded a traditional brokerage company in downtown St. Louis, but what was untraditional about what he did, what was disruptive, was that he had been treated unfairly at a brokerage before. A brokerage, all brokerages were founded on making money for the owners of the brokerage company. He founded his company on a, on a, uh, a, a really thesis of fairness 
to the financial advisor and including the financial advisor who was meeting with the clients, including the financial advisor in, in the company. So that was Mr. Jones Sr. And then his son Ted yeah. came along. <laughs> okay, so Ted was an iconoclast of the first order. He was a disruptor of everything that his father had created. Um, <laughs> his dad, uh, very, his dad looked more like Dave right now, um, dressed to the nines always, um, very upstanding member of the social community and the financial services community in St. Louis. Ted uh, would register in a hotel as farmer. That's what he wanted to be. His father forced him into the company at 23 years old because Ted was the only son. He had two sisters. This was the family-owned company. Ted had to come into the company, so his dad sent him to New York to, to um, work on the, the stock exchange floor there and learn the business. He came back to St. Louis and he said, I'll do it, but only if I can do it my way. And his way was exceedingly disruptive. So his way was rooted in, um, in the, the innovation, this idea that he had that farmers, ranchers, and small business owners in small towns in Missouri had lots of assets, but they were in the ground or they were in their companies. They needed to diversify those assets into financial assets that nobody was in that marketplace to tell them about. Because the big brokerage companies weren't gonna go to small towns. Ted wanted to be in those small towns, and so he started putting up branches in those small towns to give people advice about financial services and financial instruments. Nobody else was there. Peter Drucker, this is a symbol, we'll talk about it in just a second. Peter Drucker said, um, Ted found a market in contemplation. So Ted disrupted the industry, he disrupted wealth management, they didn't call it that at that time, he also disrupted his family. Um, this was a family-owned business. Ted said the only way for this to grow is to let it go outside the family, and I will work here only if we can let it go outside the family and only people who have worked at our company can be owners of our company. So he disinherited his sisters. They divvied up the estate at that time. They made it even at that time. It would no longer look even today. <laughs> But he was, he was just a very disruptive kind of person. That, that was Ted. He came into the firm at 23. He turned over. Uh, he became managing partner at 42. He turned over the managing partnership 12 years later to John Bachman, who we'll get to, another very young managing partner. Um, and he made that decision against his father's wishes and against many of his partner's wishes. And if I can add in here, you know, at the time, I think brokerages were under the view you have to have 20 or 30 people in an office yeah. to get scale economies. And so it's all about scale economies, efficiencies, making that money for the broker. An office with one financial advisor, right. I mean, there's no scale economies in that. It sounds, it sounds foolish. But he understood the customer relationship was exactly. what he cared about, not the efficiencies of the internal operations, at least at the time. Not that he wasn't in efficiencies were important to him. Exactly, it was all about the relationship. That is our competitive advantage. Now when we get to pragmatic innovation, his innovation in order to scale that very innovative idea of hyper-local relationship building branches, that's where the innovation had to come and, and did. So John Bachman shows up, yeah. Ted's 52 years old I think at this yeah. time, and he's been there for a while and he hands the reins over. Yeah. He could have worked for another 10 or 15, 20 years probably in that role, but he saw something in John. So let's talk about yeah. John. So John Bachman was uh, a financial advisor in Columbia, Missouri. Um, th that's where uh, University of Missouri is. It's a vibrant small town. Um, John was, um, was selling a lot of fixed income, a lot of bonds at that time. And Ted knew that our company needed to diversify it, its revenue streams in terms of what we were representing to our clients from equities and mutual funds into a fuller panoply of, of product and service for our clients. And John was kind of an expert in fixed income. So Ted learned from him while he was a financial advisor, but then he said, no, you gotta come into the home office. You gotta teach us about this from home office leadership. So um, lot, lots of things happened with that relationship, but, um, but a, a few things that were critically important to our company. John was a student of strategy. 
and he started to read about Peter Drucker. The story is, and this, this, this is not just apocryphal, um, Ted and John began to read this book. I mean, I, I, literally this book from Drucker about the principles of management. They would go into a conference room with their partners. They would read one chapter at a time. They would leave the conference room, and they would try to put it into practice. John said uh, that eventually it was just Ted and John, that everybody else got really bored with it. <laughs> but the principles of the knowledge worker and organizing a modern company around a knowledge worker were the principles that they, they put to work. Um, this book um, was... Um, was the one that Jim Weddle gave me when I became managing partner. Um, it's signed by Peter Drucker. Jim was Peter Drucker's financial advisor. He was integral to the, the non-accidental but non-inevitable success of our company. So John brought Peter Drucker to Edward Jones. He wrote him a letter, made it very clear that they had been reading his book, and invited him to come to this tiny, tiny little inconsequential company and help us um, for our future. So John became managing partner when he was 40, uh, against, as I said, against the wishes of, um, uh, of other partners and against the wishes of, of Mr. Jones Sr. Um, he was our managing partner for 23 years. That's longer than anybody will ever be managing partner again. And so his influence on our company and on our industry and on our community is, is immeasurable. And it seemed that uh, Ted and John had a very special relationship too, right? You know, and I can't figure out who's the architect and who is the person that really executed because it, it gets us into Doug Hill. But um, right. Well, so going from John Bachman to Doug Hill, um, and we'll get to innovation as I keep referencing in a, in a minute, but John was really the one with the insight that said, okay, this, this company rooted in relationship with our trusted relationship with our clients is a really important idea, but we will die if we do not get bigger. And so at the moment that we were less than 300 branches, John said, we're going to 1,000. And then he said, we're going to 10,000. He told his partners this. He said, we will die if we don't do this. His partners thought he was crazy. He didn't tell us how to do it, us. I wasn't in the room at the time. <laughs> all that he said, my, my understanding is, all that he said to his partners was, this is where we're going. Are you ready? And of course, the answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, this is the texture of the organization. Everybody said, what do we have to do to be ready for that? We have to change everything. That was the point. We have to change everything except our competitive advantage, except what we're rooted in, what we're good at, which is the relationship that we have with our clients and the experience that we seek to build with them. So the, the, the growth trajectory of the firm, the growth of our impact trajectory of our firm was, was, was architected uh, by John Bachman. Second thing that, that John was really notable for, it extended from Drucker, but it really did, it was a wellspring of, of uh, strategy from John, was that a company is defined as much by what it doesn't do as what it does do. John dubbed it trade-offs, and he penned them. There were 10 or 12 to start with. They have morphed over time, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but the trade-offs give us instruction about what we do do and what we don't do. And John Bachman always said, it's not a trade-off unless you're leaving money on the table. If you're leaving money on the table, then you have a trade-off that's important, and it's got to be connected to your, connect to your competitive advantage and what, what makes you special. And being contrarian, many of those trade-offs were absolutely against what the industry said you should be doing exactly. in this practice. So standing tall against that, resolute against that. I was becoming a financial advisor in 2000 during the dot-com bubble when our industry started to go online. And everybody said, they would say to me personally as a financial advisor, you're going to be out of business in two years because you don't do online trading. Hmm. Yeah. How that worked out. Online trading is working. 1.7 trillion in assets under care. 1.7 trillion in assets under care. Yeah, should have bet against them back then. Um, Doug Hill. Yeah. Tough, tough period. It was. Um, so Doug became managing partner um, at John's behest. Um, John was turning 65 at, as partners. We are out at 65. Ted engineered that, and it was the, he was going to be the first partner that it was going to apply to. 
in order to renew the leadership of our organization in a, in a very systematic way. So John was going to be out at 65. John had architected the growth of our company. Doug was the contractor of that growth. Doug was our chief operating officer. He aligned the entire organization around being ready, what it took to grow the number of financial advisors, which was our strategy for decades. Um, Doug really made that happen. So he was going to become the managing partner. Um, he was managing partner for two years, about 2004 to 2006. We went through a very challenging regulatory moment. It was an existential moment for our company. And Doug um, sacrificed his career completely and stepped down as managing partner after only two years. Um, and then Jim Weddle became our managing partner in 2006. Let's talk about Jim, yeah. who we have the good fortune of meeting today too, which That's is right. great. Yeah, y'all will meet Jim a little. You see a big smile on my face whenever I talk about our leaders. But, but Jim was, was the managing partner who um, invited me to become a partner, invited me into home office. John Bachman was my managing partner when I became a financial advisor, and so I was a student of their leadership. But I got to watch Jim's leadership up close and personal. Jim had been a financial advisor. He was our 200th financial advisor in Connersville, uh, Indiana, um, a resolved, resolute leader. He came in in 2006. He had a year and a half of really good times, and then the financial crisis hit, 2008, 2009. I guess it's just um, your badge of honor as a managing partner. You get one and a half good years, and then you get to deal with bombs going on. <laughs> Um, that's what Jim did. And so watching him through 2008, 2009, the perseverance that it took, um, the, the, the stalwart devotion to putting people first during that period of time was like nothing I've ever seen. He never wavered. Um, he, never, he never blinked. Um, and to be a part of that leadership structure while that was going on, while other companies in our, in our industry were, were going out of business was amazing. Um, Jim also was, uh, was behind upending a couple of our trade-offs. And so the courage that that took to do that, watching that and understanding how it did connect to our strategy was really, really important. So I'll give you an example. One of our trade-offs that John penned says, we don't manufacture our own products. Now, he penned that for a few reasons. One, we didn't have the capital to manufacture our own products. So that was preservation right there. The second thing was, at that time, we could get everything that we needed to represent to our clients from somebody else. We could be a distributor. But what Jim recognized was that was no longer the case. And in fact, we needed to have a couple of ideas, a couple of products for our clients that could be bought somewhere else. But instead, we could use our size and scale to manufacture that product, to not take a manufacturer's, pro a manufacturer's profit on that product, and represent something of higher value to our clients. So we used our size and our scale. We used our capital structure, and we used our distribution model, but we did it differently than anybody else in our industry had done it. So because of that, and I won't go too deeply into the technicals of that, but because of that, each year we save our clients nearly $400 million in fees and costs because of the way that we chose to manufacture that product. Now, there were plenty of people saying, Oh, Ted's rolling over in his grave and John's rolling over in his grave because we went against this trade-off. Actually, we decidedly went against it because the environment and context had changed. And Jim was the, the, the architect and set up the contractors um, to do that kind of, of deep work um, for the benefit of our clients and their experience. Thank you. So I'm going to switch gears with you again, if that's okay. And I'd love to uh, talk about kind of the evergreen seven Ps and, yeah. and those, those principles. And uh, you know, just how do each of those come to life at Edward Jones? And um, I'll just start at the top because yeah. we know how important it is. How about purpose? Right on. That's where it all begins. I mean, that's the wellspring of it. Um, and I'm, I'm looking down here at the, this, the monitor. The next, um, the next presentation that you're going to see is from Tina Rivas and Kevin Bastian. I, I will, I will uh, introduce them in just a few minutes. They're going to talk about our, 
our purpose and the way that we think about being a purpose-driven organization. And really explicitly at this moment, moving from a mission-driven organization to a purpose-driven organization. Those are two different things. And we uh, very explicitly took the time last year, as we were in the midst of the pandemic, to explicitly state what our purpose is. Our purpose is to partner for positive impact, to improve the lives of our clients and our colleagues, and together, better our communities and society. And we talked a lot about that last year. We made it explicit. It rhymes with everything that we've done as a mission-driven organization, but we took the time to make it explicit. And all of our strategy, all of our decisions, all of what we do springs from that statement of purpose. Terrific. Perseverance. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about perseverance um, through, through the eyes and the lens of, of the leadership of the organization. I mean, perseverance in part comes from the industry that we're in, right? I mean, we... We rise and fall, our results rise and fall with the financial markets. We help millions of clients. We have 7 million clients today. Our addressable market is 41 million families in North America. 41 million serious long-term individual investors. We think of our clients psychographically, not demographically. 41 million of them. So we help them navigate the ups and downs of financial markets in order to achieve their goals. We got to persevere through that, right? A hundred years of perseverance through the financial markets with and for our clients. We persevered through the 60s. Um, during the 60s, the, um, the, if you've ever heard of the Nifty 50, it was a go-go period in the financial markets, but the infrastructure of the brokerage industry was woefully underbuilt for that time. The stock exchange had to close two days a week and at three o'clock on the other three days a week in order to process the transactions. Uh, many companies went out of business during that time, so we persevered through that, that time. And through the great financial crisis, through 2008, 2009, there was one month when we were very close to break even and losing money. Um, but, um, but we persevered through that time. Jim Weddle was really the architect of that. Jim said, um, oh wait, we're going to people first. We are. Hang on, I'll get to that story. Okay, Just a second. <laughs> you prompted yourself. Yeah. People first. Okay, people first. <laughs> um, our clients are at the center of everything that we do. Our purpose statement says we are here to make a meaningful impact on our clients, our colleagues, thousands of communities, and indeed society. So people come first. Our clients come first in that relationship. When we put our own colleagues at the center of producing that experience and relationship, we know that we're better. Um, so the, the people first the, uh, approach that Jim took was in 2008, 2009, as we were needing to cut um, he said, we're going to cut 10% of our operating expenses. Half of our operating expenses are people. He said, we're going to cut 10% of our operating expenses, but you can't touch the people expenses. So that means go, go, go cut 20% of operating expenses apart from people. We will have no layoffs. And we didn't. And so what that enabled me to say, when we got to the pandemic, my first, second um, communication to 50,000 people was, you're going to see something really different happen in your communities and maybe even in your family's lives with what's about to happen to our economy. But we are not laying anyone off. You have your job. It's safe. We're going to stop hiring. We stopped hiring financial advisors. We stopped hiring new home office associates. We're going to stop hiring. We're going to freeze wages, but you have your job. Now, three months later, we were able to come back and say, you still have your job, and we are unfreezing wages retroactively because we put people first. That's terrific. How about private? Yeah. Well, um, private, we all know this, private enables us to do all that stuff that we've been talking about for the past 35 minutes. No public company would have been able to do what Ted did, a market in contemplation. Would have been able to put people first the way that we have. 
No public company would be able to say right now, we're investing a half a billion dollars for starters in technology in order to enable and unleash this hyper-local approach that we have to advice and coaching and guidance for 41 million people. No public company would, would, would be allowed to, the shareholders wouldn't allow them to do that. So it's a competitive advantage. It's also, I believe, one of my chief responsibilities to ensure the seamless movement of capital in our partnership, and you're gonna hear about that in just a few minutes, to ensure that capital moves seamlessly onto the next generation in order to fire that kind of innovation and growth. How about the importance of profit? So Peter Drucker said, profit is a result, not the goal. Peter said, here are the most important questions. What is your business? Who is your customer? What do they value? And how do you deliver that value? Those are the questions that you have to answer over and over and over again. And um, the, the innovation, we'll get to that in a second, but the innovation that comes from answering those questions is what's important. Profit is a result. It's not the goal. And once again, we can say that and be that way because we're private. Right. Now, there is something that, in, that fires and inspires that partnership, that private partnership, and that is as a partnership, all of our profits go to our owners. We believe that we're the largest partnership in operation in the country or the world. We have 24,000 limited partners. We have 600 general partners. We have 5,000 retired limited partners and 600 retired living general partners. And they continue to be part of the economic vitality of our organization. That's the way our partnership agreement is structured. So all our profits go out to that huge group of owners. Half of our company owns our company. And we decidedly want to expand that pie. We don't want to hoard it. Somebody said to me the other day, this is a Costco pie. This is not your regular grocery store pie. This is one of those <laughs> giant Costco pies. And Ted said, if you love something enough, you have to let it go in order to let it grow bigger. And so all of our profits go out to our owners. And then above the profit line, we have a variable compensation system where every member of our Edward Jones family on a trimesterly basis has the opportunity to receive a trimesterly bonus according to the results of the organization. So that's how we think about our profits. That's terrific. How about pace growth? Yeah. So um, paced growth in our organization is connected to how we think about impact. So our growth as an organization extended from the idea that Ted had that our impact comes in building trusted relationships. And we have to be there. We've got to be in those communities in order to build trusted relationships. So we have to put up these branches in all these communities. Our paced growth then had everything to do with the pace of opening branches and starting financial advisors. And our growth, um, our, our growth actually represented for many years the growth in our entire industry in terms of number of financial advisors because that was what our strategy was. Now, in bad years, bad years in the financial markets, that paced our growth. We had to pull back. Right, because starting new financial advisors during weak financial markets is a tough thing to do. We also paced our growth in the 90s. John did this, he shut down our training program because it no longer at that moment was fit for training financial advisors mm. that were needed by the current marketplace. Mm. So we shut it down and it was retooled and then we started again. So we paced our own growth in that way. Today we think about pacing our growth associated with our impact the growth of the impact that we want to make on clients, colleagues, communities, and society. And a lot of that pace has to do with innovation. What clients demand in terms of the complexity in their lives, um, the technology that we need to have sitting alongside the human being, the human financial advisor. Um, all of that is now requiring us to pace our growth in a way that can be digested by our people and digested by our financial advisors and in our branches, but also recognizes that the pace of change is speeding up in our industry, 
from a regulatory standpoint, and most importantly, from what our clients expect. And the entire time that you were growing, going back to early days, it was from your own profits. You didn't yeah. seek outside funding to yeah. support this growth. You kept it within the partnership. That's right. right? That's right, Dave. And so we had, you know, we had to make decisions that all, all the P's are, are interrelated, right? right? But remaining private, we knew, was integral to our success. And so during 2008, 2009, um, we determined at that moment that we did not want to be in debt. We had a little bit of debt, but we got out of all of our debt. We are overcapitalized by three times, two and a half times what's required from a regulatory standpoint. Jim said that this, our balance sheet is a fortress that can sail in any storm. And so we make decisions that enable that kind of financial endurance, but also um, inspire us to invest half a billion dollars in technology. One quick story about that. Sure. Um, there's still some auda audacity that's required of that. Um, we're, we'll talk about, we're, can we talk about pragmatic innovation? I know, we should, because okay. you keep hinting at it. So let's right. just take it right let's on. Let's talk about pragmatic <laughs> innovation. So pragmatic is sometimes taking what looks like an extreme risk in order to fire what your competitive advantage is. So remember, we were talking about scale and opening these little branches that seems like such an expensive thing to do, hyper-local, all over North America. Why are you doing that? It's much more efficient to do it. So Ted recognized that we had to build efficiency, Ted and John, efficiency around those branches. They had to be connected to the stock exchange as if the stock exchange was in the room next door. That was unheard of. So what they had to do was build a communication system like nothing that had ever been seen before. Ted spent a million dollars on that communication system when we had $2 million of capital. It was insane. I mean, partners left at that time because they thought, one more time, he was wrecking the company. His dad really hit the roof about it. Um, but, but that was pragmatic innovation at that. That was what was pragmatic to do, and it was highly innovative. It was a, it was a, a, a very innovative communication system. So we take lessons from that kind of pragmatic innovation into what we're doing today in order to continue to be, Dave said, contrarian, um, in order to take a different path in terms of serving those 41 million serious long-term individual investors. The innovation now is around the experience. The experience they're having across uh, uh, um, their entire lives, their financial lives, but also things having to do with their health, their families, their purpose, and their financial well-being. And then taking that innovation and innovation, innovating around, Jack, Jack and I were talking about this last night, innovating around financial literacy in our communities, in our high schools, because frankly, that builds the next generation of serious long-term individual investors and, and builds economic vitality that we depend on. So that's pragmatic innovation in our, in our view. Thank you. Thanks for going through all the seven Ps with us. Yeah. It's, uh, it, Thanks for having the seven P's. I mean, <laughs> right? We, we know in our companies, that's right, <laughs> right? It's just, it's right. It's how our companies ought to be built. It's how enduring companies are built. And when we saw them at Edward Jones several years ago, at, at I guess we were 97 years old when mm -hmm. we saw them. Right. It's like, yeah, I mean, this is how our company has been built. Great. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. So I'm going to come back to your leadership journey. So um, at what point? did you uh, aspire to be the managing partner of the firm? Was there a moment in time when you kind of saw that as being in your path, or did it kind of come to you as a surprise when Jim tapped you on the shoulder to think about being part of that process? Yeah. Um, I would say mostly it was a surprise that was really rooted in a learning journey. I keep going back to that. Um, and one of the reasons that I keep going back to that is that I represent a non-family member leader of our enduring visionary company that was founded by an incredible innovator. I am one more in a long list of leaders that were taught by that founder's mentality and schooled in the unique strategy of our company. 
so that I can reach back to Ted. I never knew Ted. I'm the first managing partner that did not know Ted. At some point, that was going to happen. And so I just represent one of hundreds or thousands of students of this enduring company and our strategy and why we are the way we are and why we should remain in many respects the way that we are. So all that I am is a student, an acolyte of that. And so I'm really, I'll, I'll really explicitly ask you as founders and as leaders to grow the students and the acolytes in leadership in your companies because that's what I represent. I represent someone who was given opportunities time after time after time where I was not qualified. In fact, one, one story, I, I, was, I was giving a new leader an opportunity and I needed to go to Jim to talk about it. And I said, Jim, I think this, this leader needs this opportunity. He's the right person for the role, but I think he needs, he needs a little more time. And Jim looked at me and he said, what are you going to know about him in six months that you don't know today? And I said, nothing. And he said, then put him in the role today. And he looked at me and he said, Penny, if we'd had your point of view about you, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing today. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Get the point, right? So that, you know, that, that is a long-winded answer to say I never had a plan to be in the seat. I told Jim in 2012, he asked me pointedly how I saw my future. And I said, I want to do as much as I can for as long as I can to be a part of contributing at this firm, up to and including your job. But that, that just said, I want to be put in the way of whatever experiences I can, I can be part of to help grow the impact of this company. That's, that's all that it was about. Great. And to the extent you, you can share, um, the selection of a new CEO or managing partner, partner is an incredibly important yeah. decision. So do they just have a partners meeting one afternoon and <laughs> pull your name out of a hat and give right. me the role? Or was it a little more involved than that? A little more involved than that. Um, we don't vote as a partnership, interestingly. And okay. so one of, the, one of the things that Jim recognized was the next managing partner was he was just a prescient leader. The next managing partner was likely not to have met our founder. And so how is the organization, a 50,000 person organization gonna gain confidence in this leadership role, which in a private partnership is, is somewhat different than in terms of its symbolism than a, than a public company CEO. And so Jim, Jim looked backwards and he said, okay, take, take a look at the succession process. Mr. Jones founded the company. Ted was the only successor. It was his son. It was a family-owned company. This is, a, this is the only person it's going to be. Ted appointed John because he recognized the type of innovation that we needed to, to be pointed to. He appointed John. He didn't ask anybody. In fact, a lot of people left because of it. John appointed Doug because Doug had been the, the, the contractor for our strategy, for this growth. He was going to be the next managing partner. Something really challenging happened as Doug was stepping down. And so we had this crisis moment when we needed a slightly different succession process. And there was one, but it was kind of under the covers. It was run by a group of highly, um, um, highly regarded partners, but a small group, and it happened pretty fast. Jim said, an enduring 100-year-old Fortune 300 company that is now making a mark in our industry can't have a succession process that looks like that anymore. It's gotta be confidence boosting. It's gotta be something that our entire Edward Jones family can look to and say, I've never met that person before because a lot of people didn't know me. A lot of people did, but a lot of people didn't know me. Um, she's never met, oh wait, she has never met the founder. <laughs> Why am I supposed to have confidence in this person? And so our succession process was really engineered to be, um, to be public and private in, in, in really meaningful ways to build confidence uh, um, among, our, among our colleagues in our, in our industry for the next leader. And so I'm already starting that succession process, right? Leader identification, setting people up into experiences where a large group of people are students and acolytes of our, of our business and our go forward strategy. And so one of the, the lenses I like to understand somebody's leadership style is through who they admire. Yeah. Could you share 
one or maybe two folks that you really admire, you, you, you admire their leadership, and try to kind of incorporate some of that into how you lead. Yeah. Um, I think you, you can tell that I deeply admire the leaders who came before me, and so a, a student of their leadership. Um, uh, someone that, that, I, um, that I really am um, amazed by and inspired by is Indra Nui. Uh, Indra is the former CEO of PepsiCo, and she really was the, the visionary, the architect, and in some ways the contractor of moving that company from a typical consumer packaged goods company selling salty sweet snacks to one that was very purpose driven, rooted in not just fun for you, but good for you, and rooted in sustainability. Because what she says is the countries where they operate in, where they use a lot of water to manufacture their product, and sometimes their products are not seen as the most healthy in the world, she recognized that their license to operate was gonna be determined by their purpose. And so she founded something called Performance with Purpose mm. and re-engineered the company to deliver on that. She is retired now. She's just written a new book. I, I, I recommend it. Um, she's talking about what, uh, what's necessary for well-being in our economy and among families coming out of the pandemic. Just a visionary, purpose-driven leader. She was, um, she was at our annual partners meeting. I interviewed her on stage, met her a few times um, really goading us in our purpose orientation and how we're developing our strategy. So that's a really nice lead into the next question I have for you. So you, know, you took over in 2019. Firm's doing great, yeah. right? Things are just going well. Um, but now you're in the role of managing partner. And I remember we were having a, we were hiking in Sun Valley, Idaho during our summit. And we were chatting a little bit about this. And and I, I sense this tremendous responsibility from you, you know, about the values and the mission and the purpose and the team. Yet, I, I'm not sure it was clear to you yet, kind of, what would be your contribution, right? What would be the thing that kind of defined your leadership? And I didn't get a sense that you wanted to just have change for change's sake, right. to say that, you know. Um, and then March of last year happened in COVID. And it seems like that really has formed your moment. And so I'd be curious, can you share with us kind of how you now think about your role, your contribution, and the firm kind of coming out of the lessons of, of that last year and a half? Um, I, I decidedly said it's not my role based on the, I keep pointing to the books, based on the leaders who came before me to be a caretaker of this organization. Um, they did not just take care of and preserve this organization. They took us to new levels. Every, at every single turn of leadership. And our leadership does that, it's not just me. Um, but caretaking was not what it was all about. Instead, looking to our clients and what their needs are. Looking our, at, to our competitive advantage, rooted in something that is fundamentally different than the competitive advantage that others in our industry point to. Um, the commitment that we make to tens of millions of people and recognizing in order to make good on that commitment, we actually have to change a whole bunch of the way that we do things. Mm -hmm. We say we have to move from one good way to serve a few million people to many possible ways of delivering an unparalleled experience to them to help unlock possibilities in their lives that if we aren't there, if that financial advisor and that coach is not there, will not be unlocked. And while we are stating that commitment and that strategy, the world is changing at unprecedented rates. From a regulatory standpoint, from an industry standpoint, our competitors who are all public are being goaded by their shareholders to produce new value, to, to find new revenue streams. And man, they are experimenting with all kinds of ways. So if we sit back and caretake, and by the way, we are hitting record performance. It's unprecedented levels of, of financial performance. And so it would be easy, and there are some in our organization who say, what, what's wrong with what we're doing now? Can we just, like, Penny, could you just chill? <laughs> I mean, you, 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 yeah, I, mean I, I wanna stand up to talk about this, right? Um, the purpose and the passion, the necessity, the responsibility for what we need to do, and we say what we get to do it's, it, it's unparalleled and it's goaded by those who came before us. 
um, to make good on the promises that they made. Um, we have a foundation of success, and now it's, now it's our responsibility to, to build on that. Coming out of COVID, I mean, I, I think this probably was true of so many of us. If we had not had the goad of COVID to deliver on our promise to our clients to stay connected to them no matter what, and that's what we said. At the, at the beginning of COVID, our executive committee penned a one-page set of guiding principles because we said there's no way that through distributed leadership in our organization, we, are, we at an executive committee are gonna be able to make all the decisions. We are gonna set out a set of guiding principles and everybody follow these and make the decisions on the field that need to be made. And the first one was stay connected to our clients and our colleagues no matter what. And so um, at, at, the, at the moment when it was pretty scary, rolling closures across our country and remember, we're in two-thirds of the counties of the United States with a brick-and-mortar location, so we have to follow the mandates, the local mandates, of over 2,000 counties and municipalities. We had to figure out how to do that and stay connected to our clients. It, technology was one good way that we did that, and we did it incredibly successfully. We turned on a dime in five days. We had our entire company, 50,000 people, including all of our financial advisors connected through technology to our clients and each other. If we'd not had that go, we, we, we would still be dithering around about that, right? So um, COVID really sped up technology and it reinforced our competitive advantage, which is deep trusted relationships, purpose and people first. And I'm gonna ask you one last question as we come to the end of the time. Um, Edward Jones has been deeply involved in philanthropy. But there's a shift in how you're thinking about this, and part of it coming out of the experiences of last year also, and your own life experiences. Can you talk just for a moment about that? Yeah. So um, there, there's fundamentally a difference between philanthropy and improving the opportunities and well-being for society and citizens. We, don't, we won't go too deeply into it. We're going to talk a little bit right. about that later, later on. Um, we've been deeply rooted in community and in building community for decades. We're an integral part of every community where we live and operate. And that communities and citizens thrive, that their well-being is strong, is important because it's the right thing to do. It's also the only thing that enables people to have resources to invest for the long term to create possibilities in their own lives. So there's a virtuous circle that, in fact, is critically important to our commercial enterprise. And so as we think about our purpose, our purpose statement, clients and colleagues, and together, better communities and society, our purpose is deeply rooted in helping every community where we live and work thrive. Now, that comes in part from giving money but it also comes in part from un deeply understanding the needs of a community and being part of a solution that, that, in, that, that, in, that is about bringing people together, the public sector, the private sector, regulators, legislators, um, every, every source of good that is purpose-driven, and I believe fundamentally that, that is, that's the root of why everybody's doing what they do, um, bringing that together as a convener um, to improve the well-being of, of people and communities. Penny, thank you. Thanks for the time this morning. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all. I hope for everybody enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all for listening. I love that. Thank you, Dave.